right, well, hey, let's take our Bibles. We're looking at the parables of Jesus. We're in Luke's gospel. Uh, Mark had a few more in there, but they were kind of the same thing we covered in Matthew, just in a little different light, a little different look. Uh, so we're uh, looking at Dr. Luke here. Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, we have the, the parable of the rich fool uh, that we're going to be looking at. And it's uh, the man of wealth and what he should have feared. And so something we need to look at. And uh, we'll read the first couple of verses to get the uh, kind of the background of what's going on. And then the parable actually starts in verse number 16. And you'll see that when we begin reading uh, there. But uh, we'll pick it up here, begin reading in verse number 13. And here's where we come to. Now, uh, chapter 12 actually starts off with Jesus speaking and talking about the things that, that man should fear. And then when he gets to verse 13, he begins to share a parable. Uh, but not until we get to verse 16, but he lays the groundwork down a little bit on that. So let's uh, begin reading here in uh, verse number 13. All right? Everybody in verse number 13 of Luke chapter 12. And you have it there in your outline as well. And uh, see there? So let's take a look at it. And one of the company said unto him, Master, and that's to simply say rabbi or teacher, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So right there, that kind of tells you what he's interested in. His thoughts is on material things, and he wants his inheritance. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And interesting how Jesus answers things all the time. You know, we can learn a lot from how Jesus answers things. If you go through the Gospels and read them carefully and slowly, you'll see a lot of questions are asked to the Lord. And there are a lot of times there are questions that you and I would ask and kind of similar to the same thing or perhaps the same way, maybe worded a little different. And we're kind of expecting a different answer and, you know, or what the answer we're thinking we're going to get. But Jesus, it's, it's amazing uh, the answers he comes back with sometimes. And the, simply the man just simply asked a question, uh, uh, Lord, uh, speak to my brother that he would divide the inheritance. And, Jesus, and so you would think, how would Jesus answer that? Well, look what he says, man. And you can see the Lord say, man? Now, he didn't say, come on, man. He just said, man, okay? Who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, take heed and beware. Notice two things he said there. Take heed and beware of what? Covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Now we come to verse 16, and the parable begins. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, okay, there he goes, he's thinking within himself here, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull, will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Kind of getting the picture here with the guy of all the my's and I's. And I will say to my soul, notice, he, notice it, we'll get to that in a little bit, but think about that thought for a minute. He said to, uh, to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now that was his thoughts, his thinking, and his, uh, on the whole thought of this whole thing. But here again, listen to how God answers this. But God, and that's interesting. Now he's talking to the Lord. And they called him master, which is a proper thing to call the rabbi or teacher in Jewish times, okay. But interesting, but God said unto him. Now, wait a minute. Luke just referred to Jesus as God. You see that? But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. So there's the parable. We're going to take a look at this this morning. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for our Sunday school time as we gather together again here this morning uh, with believers to uh, study the word of God, to learn and glean from it, and to see what you would have for us to, to learn today and to apply to our lives as we look at this parable you've given to us. And so, Father, we pray you would give us wisdom and understanding and wisdom to apply it. And we ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide and that he will bring all things to remembrance that Jesus has said to us. 
and he will guide us into all truth because he hears the truth from the one who is the truth and speaks the truth to us and shows us things to come. So Holy Spirit of God, we thank you for all of your help and everything that you do for us. Now we ask you to bless our time in your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, following along here, looking at your study guide this morning, uh, we notice that the man of wealth is often self-sufficient. But there are some things he needs to fear. And that's how Jesus opened up the chapter 12, beginning with that. If you read the first 12 verses, he's talking about that. But there are some things that, uh, that uh, the wealthy person, the wealthy man, must, uh, that thinks they're so self-sufficient, there are some things you need to fear. You know, we don't have to be wealthy, though, class, to be self-sufficient. As a matter of fact, if you're saved today, you're wealthy. If you have a home today, you have a car today, you have clothes, you had a meal last night, you realize, you realize you're wealthy? Amen. You know, there's only 5% in America that are classified as the wealthy. If you want to into that circle, those that would have that kind of finances. So that tells us that 95% of the rest of us are really wealthy. Amen? Hey, different ways you could look at it. All right, so the passage, if we wanted to try to outline it, which is what we've tried to do uh, here, we put, first of all, there's a request for Jesus to give a judicial decision. Because if you go back and study Jewish times during that thing, that's exactly what many of the rabbis did. The rabbis were involved in helping divide inheritances and making judicial decisions uh, on that, just like a magistrate or a judge in dividing the inheritance. The same thing you'd go today if you went before the judge or magistrate over a will. You know, sometimes if you didn't have a will and the state's involved, then you have a magistrate or a judge that's going to reside over that, and they're going to make that legal decision of the inheritance and so forth. So it wasn't uncommon for this man to ask Jesus, who was a rabbi, a master teacher, uh, make a decision on this judicial matter of dividing of this inheritance. So that's kind of what was going on. But Jesus is going to try to get him there some things that you need to fear. He change, he's changing his direction around. He says, fear life, uh, uh, fear, number one, life does not consist in things. That's the first thing he told him in verses 15 through 19. He says, life does not consist in things. Second fear, he said, the soul may be required and demanded tonight. <laughs> you need to be thinking about that, you know, tonight. And the third fear is wealth is not a permanent possession. Someone else is going to get it. <laughs> you might as well face it, gang. I mean, you can store it all up if you want to, but you're not going to get it. <laughs> it, was, when it when, yeah, when, when, uh, actually, what you're doing right now, you're saving and hoarding up for somebody else. That's what you're doing. I mean, really, when you think about it. I mean, because if, if death was to knock at your door right now, that's what Jesus said. Hey, hey uh, sir, whoever he was talking to, this man, you'd better think of something else because your soul may be required of you today. Matter of fact, it was. God said today, you're going to die. And then, and then he said, well, who's these things all going to be? So think about all your collection and all your prize joys and gems and jewels and gold and money and all the wonderful things you, you sometimes wish you had and, and think about having. And uh, uh, guess what? Somebody else is going to get them. Sometimes it's not even all in your family doesn't even get them. Somebody else gets it. I know, been there twice already. You know, so uh, even in our own family, uh, you know, uh, my sister and I, we were just basically cut out of everything, you know. And uh, so, you know, that's great. That's fine that God has provided. See, because God didn't want me to depend on those things. God didn't want me to trust in those things. And here I, my sister and I, we both were kind of, you know, looking forward to, you know, getting a little inheritance from dad and so forth, you know. Uh, he didn't have much, but, uh, you know, what he had, uh, uh, certainly the man things I would have liked to had. And then, of course, uh, what little money he had would have been divided between my sister and I. And, uh, you know, we, we got zero. The only thing I got was I got to preach his funeral and buried him and got his flag. That was it. And his 21 brass from his gun salute. And that's what they handed me. And my sister got nothing. And then when my aunt and uncle died, uh, we were, at one time, I thought we were in the will, according to my aunt. Uh, you know, there were things there. My aunt and Uncle Betty, they had, they had no children. So she claimed the, the six of us kids 
uh, you know, my four cousins from Uncle Benny, her brother, and, and my sister and I from my dad, her brother, uh, that we were their kids, and they were going to see to it that all the kids had something, but when it all ended up, uh, Don and I, we got zero. And once again, God says, you know, hey, I'm going to take care of you, not aunt and uncle. I'm going to provide your needs, not your aunt and uncle. So don't get all upset and don't worry about all these things that you didn't get anything. And you know what, if I stop and look back now and see that what my dad may have had and given me, God has doubled and tripled that to my life. So you see, God gave it anyway. You know, it's kind of like Job. You might look at it. Look what Job had and Job lost. Wow. And then guess what? God doubled everything Job had. So I mean, so it's, it's fantastic. So there's some things. So let's kind of get into this and break it down a little bit if we can as we take a look at it this morning. All right, first of all, we notice not really hard is it difficult in verses 13 and 14. There's this request for Jesus to give a judicial decision concerning the inheritance. So in verse 13 of this inheritance, uh, he's asking him to make a decision concerning an inheritance and wealth. And certainly we all think about wealth. And certainly we need finances to operate and survive. And God knows that. I mean, but, you know, we just, uh, this is what this guy was concerned about. And what we need to learn from this, folks, is as we look at this man, uh, we need uh, to, to do basically the opposite. You know, we don't need to be so concerned about wealth and money and finances because God's going to take care of that. And when it comes to an individual, I mean, how much do you want? And the rich man always says just one dollar more. You know, there's, and that's what this guy was saying. Man, I've got all this, and the barns aren't big enough, the, the warehouses aren't big enough, so I've got to get more and more and more and more and more. And God says, not a problem. You're going to die tonight. Whoa. You see, why? Because it's appointed unto man once to die, after that the judgment. And you see, we don't know when, where, or how we're going to die, but you better know where you're going when you do. Because that's what's going to count. That's the only thing that's going to count. And, uh, you, you know, we can't take, in all your lives that you've seen funerals go by, and watch you know, for a second. I sat uh, yesterday going out of our place to go to the grocery store there to get something for lunch. And I had to sit and wait at the stop sign there uh, for quite a while because there was a funeral procession coming. And, you know, here come the police and the escort, the sheriff guys that do that. They're right there in our neighborhood and down the boulevard. And, and then here came the hearse and here come the families and the cars all lined up with their lights and blinking to, you know, who it was. And, you know, and the only thing I didn't see, I didn't see a, a U-Haul trailer being pulled behind the hearse. He wasn't taking anything with him. All he had with him, or he or she, whoever was in there, was whatever the funeral director dressed him in. That was it. That was it. So let's not be so concerned about an inheritance or wealth. You see, this man was all he was thinking about. Hey, man, somebody's died, and I want my goods, my portion. And boy, have you ever noticed if you've been in any of this, in family, like we did at my sister and we went through it. You know, when a loved one passes away, the wolves come out of the woodwork. And boy, here comes the fighting and the, and the bickering and the arguing, and this is mine, and that's mine, and I earned this, and I deserve this, and ay, ay, ay. I mean, you'd never see anything like it. Well, we need to be careful. So notice this man was, his total thoughts and concern was on getting something. Wealth, gaining, profit, you know, gain, getting ahead, greed, uh, you might say. But notice Jesus' stern refusal. Verse 14, Jesus gives him a very stern refusal there. And uh, in verse 14, he looks at that man, he says, and he said unto him, man, that's the stern uh, refusal that we get here. Who, who made me a judge or divider over you? I could just see the Lord speaking to him like this. So I want you to note, and, and that was a common practice for rabbis to settle legal disputes. But I think there's five things we see here in the life of this and this, what's happening here. Number one, I think the man was in, was in the congregation. Now watch this. No doubt he was in the congregation, whoever Jesus was speaking to in the crowd. And you've got to go back and read verse 10 and 11 and so forth and gives you the idea where Jesus is at and what's going on. All right? So there's no doubt he was in the congregation listening to Jesus preach. Amen? He's listening. But it's interesting what the man wanted was significant to him, what he wanted. But you see, Jesus is here teaching, and 
the law, he's teaching the biblical principles, he's teaching statutes, he's, teaching, he's preaching the gospel you know, to this crowd that's listening. And, and Jesus refused rather sternly there, number three. And we find when we get to the fourth thing here about this, the man exposed a serious flaw in his spiritual, spiritual life. Now think about this today. Oh, we gotta apply it to us today. All right, the man exposed a serious flaw in his spiritual life. You see, church, listening to the preaching does not mean that you're hearing the word. Amen. Okay? A lot of people are listening, but they're not hearing the word. The logos, they're not hearing it. That man was in the service, okay, Jesus, by all means, is the preacher. You'd really think you'd want to listen up and listen, amen? But he wasn't. Where was his thoughts in his mind? His mind was on his inheritance. His mind was on the greed and the wealth that he was going to obtain. Here Jesus is teaching something maybe pertaining to eternal life or whatever, and this guy's thoughts and minds are somewhere else. And, and I can see that even in the church in here when we're preaching. It's amazing. Uh, you, you, you can watch the faces of people and so forth, and you can see when all of a sudden they go wandering. Their eyes, their head, and, and you, just, you can see, okay, they've drifted off and, and, and gone off into whatever thoughts they're thinking of, what's ever on their mind, you know, their heart, and, and so forth. But you see, listening to the preaching does not mean that we hear the word, nor do we learn from it. Because you see, when people, when people go out and totally ignore it and don't apply it, then they haven't learned anything. They were there. I mean, they were there, okay? You see, they, they, they hear the word, nor they learn from it. His mind was wandering. And boy, you can see that today in the life. And, and we can all admit that we've, that's done, we've all done that. How many times have we sat and listened to preaching and, and, you know, we may be right there and it's interesting. I've even seen some and maybe even myself, who knows, through the years. You're listening along, you go, amen, hallelujah. But at the same time, your mind's thinking about, you got to go here, you got to go do this, you got to do that. And, and then we walk right out the door and supposedly everything that we heard just kind of goes by the wayside. And we don't apply it to our lives and we don't do it. So the fifth thing that this man, I think, was uh, struggling with here uh, was the contrast between his mind and attitude of the man and Jesus is significant. You see, Jesus needs to be the most significant thing in our lives, and that ought to be more to us and mean more to us and desire more to us than things and materialism and so forth. And, and so there was a the man was struggling with his mind in his attitude about the Lord Jesus who he was supposed to be paying attention to and listening to. But he was struggling with it because he was caught up in greed, wealth, money, materialism, possessions. And let's face it, uh, we've become a nation of materialism and a nation of greed and money and want more and more and better and bigger. And I mean, you know it, you see it. Uh, you see it even in your own families. You, you see it in your friends, your neighbors. I mean, this, this was where we're at. And uh, materialism, greed, and wealth, I believe, has become the God of America. And I think sports has become a God of America. Amen. I think entertainment has become a God of America. And, and by the way, these are all idols. That's what we can call idolatry, idol worship because we worship the creature more than the creator. Amen. And, and, and that's, that's the problem. And, and I mean, like today, I was talking with someone yesterday had called me and we were uh, talking a little bit and, and we got into a little bit of a church and going to church and you know, immediately uh, you know, uh, Sunday night it was mentioned and oh, we're, we're going here, we're doing this. And you know, I'm thinking, you know, that's, that's where we're at, you know? They were more interested in where they were going and what they were doing. And, you know, well, we did God a favor this morning, so, you know, tonight we're going to do this or do that. And it was, it, was just, it was something of pleasure, entertainment, excitement. And, you know, and these, quote, claim to be believers and saved. And I was sitting there, you know, wow. It just uh, after going through this, I said, yeah, there's no doubt. That the God of entertainment and money and wealth and greed and, and prosperity and fame and fortune oh my, 
uh, we're in, in, in sad shape and uh, as believers. Well, listen, so the first thing, here was this request. Uh, he wanted Jesus to make a judicial decision, and he got a different answer, didn't he? Isn't that really the way it goes most of the time? We ask the Lord a question in our mind and our thinking, and, and if we want to know where, how Jesus answers us, we have to go to the Word. Amen. And the Word will tell us what the answer is. And you know what? Probably if most of us are honors, we don't like the answer. Amen. We don't. And this man, he didn't like the answer either. <laughs> and he definitely didn't want to hear that he'd go die tonight. <laughs> I can tell you that. I mean, <laughs> so uh, let's, let's take a look at the first fear here now. So that kind of gives us into the introduction here and what's been going on with verses 13 and 14. So verses 15 through 19, life does not consist in things. Amen. So when in verse 15 through 19 here, Jesus gives this man a very serious charge. It was a very serious charge, and, and what is that charge? Two things he told the man he needed to do. What was it? Look at it. And he said unto them, take heed, that's the first charge, and the second is, and beware of covetousness. So the first thing he told them, he says, this serious charge that he gave to the, to the group there, uh, since the conversation had kind of changed between he and the Lord, this man, and so he's going to deal with it now. He said, you better take heed and beware Jesus said, hey, you better pay close attention to what I'm saying here. Listen up. Get the memo. And he says, and the word beware means to guard oneself from some enemy. What's the enemy? Covetousness. Greed. Wealth. Possessions. Gain. Jesus says, hey, man, you better listen up what I'm trying to tell you here. Because your life doesn't consist in the abundance of things. And if that's where you're going, let me tell you what's going to happen. For this particular guy, doesn't mean this is going to happen to everybody, but in this story, for this particular guy, hey, bud, you're going to die tonight. Whoa. I'm sure he wasn't expecting to hear that. Amen. So he says, hey, pay close attention. Guard yourself from the enemy. What is the enemy? Covetousness. Want more. Greed. Give me. My, I mean, you see that in, in, in here. I mean, how many times does he use the word I? Six times. I, 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 I. My, 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 my. I mean, you know, and Jesus said, hey, hey, buddy, you better listen up. So he was telling the whole crowd. Jesus was using this time to, to, to speak to the whole group and say, hey, listen, learn from this man here right now. Learn from what I'm trying to tell you. Pay attention. Listen up. Be alert. Wake up. Open your eyes. Open your ears. And listen, guard yourself from the enemy. Now, let's make it practical for us, all right? You may say, well, the enemy uh, to me in your life, and you may be very honest about it. Some of you here could care less about material things. Money, wealth, it just doesn't bother you. You're not interested in it. There's not even a temptation there. Okay, great, praise the Lord. Amen, that you don't have that temptation to have to deal with. Hallelujah. You know, it just doesn't, it doesn't get you. But what about some other things maybe that does? See, there, there, there's other enemies just besides greed and wealth and materialism and covetousness. There's other enemies. So we can apply the application here that we need to pay attention. Uh, be alert. Stay awake. Beware. Guard yourself, oneself, from, notice, some enemy is what the word means. Now, the enemy could be anything. Whatever it is that may be in your life that you're struggling with. Whatever you're, you're having difficulty with. Uh, you know, that, that could be your enemy. And Jesus says, hey man, you need to guard. Hey man, that's what he said. Man, listen to me. You know, today the big saying is, especially among sports people and announcers and so forth. Come on, man. I mean, you know that. Well, just kind of like what Jesus was saying here. Come on, man. Listen up. Pay attention. Your life doesn't consist in your barns and all of your wealth. Because I'll tell you why, buddy. You're going to die tonight. Whoa. I don't think I want to hear that. And you say, well, that doesn't apply to me. No. It's pointed unto man wants to die. After that, the judgment. We're all going to face death one day sooner or later. You know, if Jesus doesn't come today, then guess what? We could face death today. 
If he doesn't come tomorrow, we can face death tomorrow. We don't know when it's going to knock on our door. So don't let wealth and greed and covetousness and, or the enemy, whatever it may be, don't let it consume you. Amen. Don't let it consume you. Guard yourself from it. Uh, so that's the first thing he tells him there. You need, you, you need to be aware of. Okay, So that, that's some great lesson there we can learn from that. All right? All right, now notice one of the big things he needed to guard himself from. And we all struggle with this. The big sin. You ready for the big sin? Here's the big sin in verse 15. The big sin. Here it is. Covetousness. That's the big sin. The big sin of covetousness. And it's in verse 15. Okay? Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Actually, verse 16. In verse 16, and he spake a parable unto them, this is the group now, saying, and he goes to give the ground about this man that had a lot and plenty, and he thought within himself saying, and here they go. You ought to circle them if you have your Bible. The big, the, the big sin is covetousness, and within that, because see, covetousness is something we want and we desire, and sometimes people do everything they can do to get it. You know, the best thing to do is wait on God, and if God wants you to have it, God will give it to you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things shall be added unto you. You see? And so here it is. It's the big I. The big I verses. In verses 16 through 19, where the peril begins, we find the big I six times in verses 16 through 19. Six times. So see, the big sin of covetousness, which involved self all about I. Hey, I know somebody else that had five eyes. This guy had I, six I wills. Somebody else had five I wills in Isaiah chapter 14. You remember who that guy was? The five I wills of Satan. I will arise. I will be this. I will do this. I will be the most high. I, 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 I. Well, this guy's got six of them. So we see, secondly, we see this guy here very, he's very aggressively self-centered. Because it's all about I, me, myself, and I. I will, I will, I will, will. my, 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 my. You see that in there as well. And so this guy is totally self-centered. It's all about him. So first of all, we see the man uh, was blessed materially tremendously. He was blessed tremendously. He was tremendously blessed. But you notice in his testimony here, he didn't thank God for any of it. He didn't thank God for any of it. He didn't, how, how many of you have been blessed here today? How many of you have lots of blessings? Amen. Whether they're financial blessings, whether they're material blessings or spiritual blessings, you've been blessed. When's the last time you thank God for your blessings? You know, when we were at, at the surgery uh, Friday morning there with, with, uh, with Sharon, uh, you know, we, uh, we had prayer. The doctor came in and talked to us and it was really good. Really nice guy. I liked him. You know, if you want a cardiology, this is a guy, one of the guys to go to. But then Dr. Robert Feldman came by. Hey, Dr. Feldman, how are you? Oh, hey, Pastor, how are you? I said, yeah, everything all right? I said, yeah. I said, thanks for recommending me to Lou Land. He says, well, just keep it there, all right? Don't come to my office. And I said, I got you. He said, you don't need this. He didn't want to do a hard cath on me. So he's a pretty neat guy. He's cool. But, uh, you know, we, we had a really nice, sweet time of prayer with her before uh, the, with the doctor and them there before she went in. Uh, you know, he was saying, you know, how this is 2% of this and 1% of this, and, you know, just trying to really encourage her that this is, a, you know, a walk in the park and, you know, a little Sunday school class thing. But, hey, man, anytime somebody shoves up some probes up your veins and arteries into your heart, that, that's serious stuff. You get a puncture, and you're going to have a bleed out, and you want to watch people start scrambling, and you'll hear over the PA system, we have a code blue in the laugh cab. We have a code blue, and, you know, you don't want to hear that. But, you know, but anyway, we were, we were just asking the Lord for his blessing in his hands and, and everything. And then finally when she came out and came back in, she was fine. And everything went well. And I said, okay, well, we're going to leave and take off now. I said, but before we do, now let's thank God. See, let's not forget to thank the Lord what he just did. We asked him for this. He granted it. He answered it. Now let's thank him. Because a lot of times we just, okay, everybody's fine. You're good. All right, have a lunch. I'll see you later. And we take off. And we forget to thank God. And this man was so blessed, so blessed materially wise, he forgot to thank God for his blessings. Notice, how do I know that? Well, look at, this, look at the, the, the second one there. The man called the fruits of the ground and the possessions he had, notice, 
my fruit and my goods. Folks, let me, let me get something clear right here. Anything you have, the Bible says every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights from above. Every gift you have, every blessing you have comes from God. Matter of fact, everything you own comes from God. You don't own anything. If you're saved, it all belongs to Him. You and I are just stewards of it. We're just managers of what God has put in our uh, uh, care to manage what belongs to Him. And so, but this man, oh, no, no, this is my fruit. These are my goods, verses 17 and 18. Well, again, notice this man called his soul my soul. There's no indication that this man had ever given his soul to God. He was lost. See, God blesses the lost, too. You know, and, and this man, just, there was no indication here, and I'm not saying it could, but at least in this passage, it's nowhere else where Luke deals with it. And we find that this man had not given his soul to God because he says, he didn't say the Lord's soul or the soul the Lord has given me. No, it's my soul, my goods, my fruit. Well, what, we, what do we see here with this guy? Like so many of us sometimes, he was puffed up. He was prideful with what he had done. And he began to think of bigger and bigger and of I and I or my and my. Because you read it, that's exactly what he was doing. Let's read it again. And he thought within himself, there he goes, he's thinking himself saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul. I mean, this guy's really <laughs> in love with himself. It's all about him. And how many times have you heard people and everybody say, I'm a self-made man or woman? Or look at all I have. Look at all I've learned. Look at all I've made. Look how I've successed. And this, 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 and this. And never mention once the Lord. You know, folks, even no matter what the lost has, they, they, they fail to forget that, that God has given them the brain and the thoughts and the mind they have to accomplish what they have and get. I mean, just it all belongs to him. But this guy was so consumed with himself, so consumed with his possessions, so consumed with everything he had, uh, I hate to kind of think that the Lord here was going to have to use a very drastic example. I mean, a severe example. You think about it. The big mistake that this guy made in verse 19, self-indulgence. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Man, I'll tell you what, everything you got right now can be wiped out in a second. Right. It could be everything you have could be, could be lost in a split second of time to all of us. I mean, no question about it. He said, so I'm going to eat, I'm going to take ease, I'm going to eat, drink, and I'm going to be merry, man. I'm going to party and live it up. Well, the self-indulgent and extravagant living. Why? Well, because number one, he thought only of himself. Selfish. Selfish. And, 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 and uh, Paul told Timothy that in the last days and perilous times, that men will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. Amen. Okay? And that's where we're at. That men will love pleasure more than God. That's where we're at. Even within the church today. I mean, we see it all, 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 all the time. So this guy thought only of himself. And what he did is he, he, he took and he put off living and enjoying life, real life, until he could get all of his barns built. In other words, he's a workaholic. Nothing wrong with work now. Man doesn't earn the right to eat if he doesn't work. But he was a workaholic. He was so consumed of making more and more and more and getting more and more, having more and more and, and bigger and bigger and better and better. And I know people like that today, and I'm telling you, people are in hock, they're in debt. Oh yeah, they got a lot of things got all kinds of things. If you looked at it, you think, wow, man, these people either got money, they're wealthy, they're successful, but see, they haven't shared with you their bank account yet. They haven't shared with you their credit card statements. 
The average family in America today of four is $25,000. Last thing I read on it was $25,000 in debt in credit cards. The average family. And I'll tell you another thing. It's producing it right now, the gas prices. Where are these people getting the money to buy their gas? As I've gone to the pumps myself, credit cards. It's easy, it's convenient, but now you see they're not charging 20 and 25 dollars. They're charging 80 and 90 dollars on their credit card. And then most of the cards are going to charge you 13, 14, 15, even higher than that percent interest on that card. So our wonderful government and fearless leader is putting families and more people in more debt because they have to have gas. They need fuel. And so, and so where are they going to get it? Your credit cards. And so be careful with that. Okay, just, just be careful. You know, don't, don't get yourself in credit card debt because the interest on that will eat you up. You can charge $1,000 on a credit card and if you pay just the minimum every month, it'll take you 10 years to pay it off. If you don't ever use it again. Go buy your $1,000 product, throw the card in the drawer like you've never seen it. Don't ever touch it again. Pay your minimum bill of $10 a month. And it's going to take you 10 years to pay that thing off. Because of the interest. Just be careful. Just be careful. Beware. Be alert. Hey, take heed. Watch out for the enemy. Do you realize that an enemy, a credit card, could be your enemy? Could get you in debt and get you in trouble? So be careful with that. Again, try to conserve your going and doing. Plan your trips and your circles where you go. Put off things that you can do all in one day rather than five days a week running. And uh, another little tip, drive a little slower. I've been driving slower myself. Conserve a little bit on fuel. You know, and... Another thing that will help you psych psychologically, mentally, before you get to the halfway mark on your tank of gas, go fill up. Because you see, when you pull in there and you fill up, you're only going to spend $30. And you're going to go, wow, I got a full tank of gas. It only cost me $30. And when you see that on the pump, $30, that's a whole lot more mentally and psychologically than you let it get down to below three quarters and you just put $90 in it. And when you jump in your car and you turn your key on, oh man, I filled up my car for 30 bucks. It'll help, believe me. It's a whole lot nicer looking at 30 on that gas pump than 90. Saw one the other day, my daughter called me and she said, I don't know who was in front of me, but the guy in front of me, I pulled up to his pump, he spent $160 for fuel. And I went, yow. One of our ladies was sharing with me here the other day in the church, they went up and filled up their truck, 70 some dollars, and the truck wasn't completely empty. And I said, yeah, wouldn't it be nicer if it was sitting just before the half and you filled it up for $35? Yeah, that sounds good. You're going to end up spending the same amount of money, yes, but uh, that, that shock of uh, $70, 80 $90 is, is rough. Uh, just be careful with that. And here's another thing. Some of you buy gas with cash. Nothing wrong with that. Well, what are you going to do when you pull up to the tank and you weren't, listening, you weren't paying attention and you're empty and you put $90 in it? And you look in your wallet, and you don't have $90 cash. Or you look in your purse, uh-oh, I don't have $90. Then you got to go inside very embarrassed with your hand in your hat, and uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have enough to pay for this. Uh, can I leave you my gold watch for collateral so I can go home and get some money? Or can I leave you this? Here's my driver's license. I'll drive home without it because so, i got to come back and get my driver's license until I can come back with a check or some money or you're on the phone calling a friend or family member, hey, I, I need help. Uh, I'm at the gas station and I spent $90 for gas and I only got $30 in my pocket. Just be careful. Watch out. Thirdly, and we're done. This man, he had only thought of what? These things. His thoughts was strictly on these things. Oh, we got to quickly, I got to go. All right, last page. Number three, the third fear. Jesus said, fear this. It says number two, but this is number th tonight. May be required and demanded tonight. Secondly, you need to fear judgment. Why? Remember, it was God who spoke. And remember, the man died that night. Uh -huh. Okay, think about it. The soul was required and demanded that night, and God called this man 
a fool. A fool. Fear number three, verse 21. Just remember always, church, wealth is not a permanent possession. Someone else gets it. Isn't that what Jesus said? So, we learn a really a good lesson from this rich, rich, the rich fool that God called him. And uh, let's take and apply what we've learned today. Just be careful with your thoughts, your spending, your greed, your possessions, your wealth, your, your, your wanting. And, you know, the Bible tells us to be content with whatever we have. Amen. And here's a good lesson. If you don't have the money to buy it, don't buy it. Don't, don't get yourself in credit card debt. Now, if you can purchase it with a credit card and pay it off in 30 days, wonderful. Praise the Lord if you can do that. But don't, don't get yourself in debt. Just be careful. Amen. Jesus said, take heed. Pay attention. Guard yourself from the enemy. Amen. And the enemy can come in all different facets and face. So, Father, we thank you for today. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your instructions. Now, we've, we've listened, we've heard. Now, Father, help us to apply it. Help us to take heed now this morning. Help us to, to guard uh, from the enemy uh, as we serve you and live for you and uh, to help us to be not consumed with, with possessions and wealth and greed and, and money and more and bigger uh, because we learned a real lesson here. You might say to us the same thing you said to that man. Today you're going to die. And somebody else is going to get all of this. So, Father, we thank you. We praise you now. Bless our time in your service and the following. And thank you again for a beautiful day, beautiful weather. We praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.